Hello everyone. Sorry we're running a little bit late. We've had some technical issues, but welcome to the Drug and Alcohol Capacity Building Program for Primary Care Providers. And tonight we're talking about drug and alcohol, helping our patients in the GP setting. Just waiting for someone else to join us, but um, while that's happening, I'll just explain the format tonight. We want it to be a little bit informal, so um, each presenter is going to be uh, presenting on the slides, but we're encouraging some interruption from all of the participants tonight, so you might get a bit of debate among the presenters, and uh, we also want you to post questions, provide feedback, and contribute to the discussion. If you are going to post questions, click more, then chat buttons. We'd love to have your contribution. This webinar series extends the scope of the RACGP SNAP guides. You'll all be familiar with SNAP that covers smoking, nutrition, alcohol and physical activity. So we're going to be aiming at improving capacity of primary care providers to provide treatment for drug problems as well as comorbid mental health issues using the same sort of principles. So it's something that you're all familiar with. So we're using the five A's and uh, that's with respect to drug and alcohol and comorbid mental health. And tonight we're going to be looking at the first of those, ask and assess, screening, assessment and readiness to change. On the 13th of March, we'll be looking at advise and agree and covering brief interventions, motivation, interviewing and negotiating goals. On the 10th of April, we hope you'll join us to be looking at assisting people with drug and alcohol and comorbid mental health problems. And we'll be looking there at treatment in the GP setting, including withdrawal and pharmacotherapy. Lastly, on the 8th of May, we'll be looking at arranging treatment and follow-up, when and how to refer to drug and alcohol and mental health services. So tonight, um, I'm... Uh, the first speaker, as you can see, and my name is Amanda Baker, and I'm a clinical specialist. I'm joined hopefully by Hester Wilson, who is in Sydney, and she's an addiction medicine specialist, and she is um, currently experiencing a few technical issues. So um, we have had her online, and we're hoping she'll join us soon. I believe we've also uh, got uh, Dr. Parker McGinn, who's the Director of New South Wales and ACT Research and Evaluation Unit at GP Synergy. I think he's successfully joined us online. Hi, Parker. Nice to see yeah. you. Hi, hi, Amanda. Hi, oh, nice to hear you too. And um, in the room with me, we've got Dr. Carly Bailey, who's the Clinical Manager of the Drug and Alcohol Counselling Services under Primary Care, and uh, Stephen Ling, who's a nurse practitioner, Drug and Alcohol Clinical Services Liaison uh, service at the John Hunter Hospital here in the Hunter. So just talking about uh, prevalence first off, just to set the scene, uh, drug and alcohol use is incredibly common and in the GP setting it's something that you know, you'll be seeing uh, every day and in four out of 10 Australians they've either smoked daily, drunk alcohol or um, at a, a risky level or used illicit drugs in the previous 12 months. So it's really something that almost half of you know, Australians uh, in the uh, previous 12 months have um, done something that might be placing them in harm's way with regards to drug and alcohol. So it must be high on our agendas to be looking at in the primary care setting. So the National Drug Strategy Household Survey showed that uh, smoking, um, although Australia is doing really well, we've still got 3 million Australians who are still smoking and that's at a daily level. So we really need to address smoking among uh, uh, GP practice um, setting clients. In terms of alcohol, three quarters of the population drank alcohol in the past 12 months and about a quarter of the population exceeded single occasion risk guidelines. So risky drinking is something uh, that we need to be alerted to. In terms of illicit drugs, about 43% of people have ever used an illicit drug. 
And in the last 12 months, one in six will have done so. The most commonly used illicit drugs being cannabis, painkillers and opioids, cocaine and ecstasy. And I guess that's re extremely relevant at the moment, Amanda, with the upscheduling of codeine recently. Um, I guess we're going to have a number of people presenting to their GP wanting assistance with their whatever codeine use disorder they may have. Yeah, so it's a big issue at the moment. And the only other thing that I wanted to highlight is the single occasion risk guideline is the guideline two in the 2009 guidelines for drinking. So that's binge drinking. And that just means any more than four standard drinks per drinking mm -hmm. occasion puts them at risk of an alcohol related injury. So that's all great. Yeah, thank you. All right, good. More comments as we go along would be great. Just in terms of um, overall prevalence in, uh, for comorbidity, um, I've just got a statistic that I don't want to give too many statistics tonight, but around 45% of Australians, so almost half of Australians will experience a high prevalence mental disorder such as depression or anxiety or a substance use disorder in their lifetime. So we're talking about half of Australians in their last lifetime will be experiencing at least one of these problems. So the BEACH study, the Bedroom Evaluation and Care of Health data showed that GP settings actually see pretty representative sort of samples of those um, uh, prevalences in terms of smoking, alcohol, um, and what we've got here too is overweight. So what you get um, is an interaction between drug and alcohol use and weight. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a moment. But two thirds of people are either overweight or obese. And around 50% of people attending a GP practice will have at least one of those three risk factors on presentation. So looking at those unhealthy behaviours, we know that smoking is a real villain because that crosses all the main um, causes of mortality, heart disease and stroke, cancers and respiratory. So smoking, although it's been um, gone down to about 14% of the population, we've really got to address that, particularly in people who have coexisting substance use and mental health problems because it's very, very high among those um, uh, those uh, people with such problems, for example, 66% of people with psychotic disorder still smoke as opposed to 14% in the general population, and up to 90% of people with drug and alcohol problems smoke. So it's a huge problem in comorbidity. So smoking is central and is often the cause of death among people with mental health or drug and alcohol problems. So smoking doesn't exist um, in isolation. Usually uh, it is also accompanying those clusters of behaviours such as problem drinking, inactivity and poor diet. So what we want to talk with you about over the next four webinars is the behavioural, what a GP can do and say to people and also as we've got doctors and nurses um, also um, giving advice not only on what to say, but also medical treatments of uh, obesity, drug and alcohol problems, and mental health problems and comorbidity as well. So this is just showing that, um, again, this cluster of behaviour occurs naturally together. Smoking and drinking go hand in hand. You know, um, not personally, I'm sure, but you know if um, People have a few beers or whatever, they'll have be munching on um, high fat, high salt foods. There'll be a ciggy going in the corner. And often as people um, rely more and more on screen time and uh, isolated activities such as these, they get to enjoy them more and more, they become more and more isolated. And depression and anxiety start to accumulate as people start to um, depend more on alcohol and drugs as, as part of their everyday uh, activities. So it's a big, big um, sort of cluster of behaviours, the association between mental health and drug and alcohol and, and um, physical health. We need to sort of address all three. And the GP 
and nurse practitioner or practice nurse, as I should more correctly say, are in are ideally placed in order to address that comorbidity because they occur together and one interacts with the other. So I think this might be uh, the last slide for me. I'm a psychologist, so I just can't let it go by without saying that it's uh, not just what we say, but how we say it's really important. And um, we really know that an empathic war uh, nurse or GP is going to really get their message across your relationship with your patients, just as or as important as what we're going to tell you about content. So. Keep that in mind, it's really important to um, keep up your good communication skills. I know you're all really busy and sometimes it's uh, very easy for communication to, to suffer, but see what you can do to address the communication, either through use of um, automated tools that we might talk about later tonight um, and certainly talking in a warm, empathic and reflective and listening way with your patients. And correct me if I'm wrong, Amanda, but my understanding is that study after study has clearly shown that it's really the therapeutic relationship with the patient that is the most valuable thing in leading to behavioural change. Yeah, so there have been studies around um, for, for many years showing that if you do CBT, which is known to be effective uh, well, you get good results, but if a different therapist who is rated as not warm and not empathic, that same CBT doesn't get the same good results. You're going to say something, Kai? The, the only thing that I wanted to add to that is that therapeutic connection with your patient will lead to them disclosing or being them more likely to disclose to you what levels they're drinking or if they're smoking cannabis or they're using other drugs. So it's very important. Yeah, good point. So it opens communication yeah. both ways, yeah. I believe we've got Hester. You. That's fantastic. Hi. Hi, everybody. I can't see myself, so I've no idea if my head's half chopped off. But look, I just wanted to reiterate some of the things that you guys had said, the value of the Therapeutic Alliance. And for us as GPs, one of the um, advantages, one of the fabulous advantages that we have is that longitudinal relationship that we have with our patients. And, and you guys are right that it can lead to disclosures that people might not make in other settings. Um, the other important thing about the way that we talk to our patients is using the non-stigmatising, non-discriminating language. The other really important thing about that therapeutic alliance is that you don't actually need to know everything. It's okay not to know everything. But if the basis of how you're talking to your patients is non-stigmatising and it's, it's warm and empowering empathic and supportive with good boundaries around what's safe and what's not safe. You don't actually have to know everything. You can find out the knowledge, but the approach is how you do it is really important. So we're going to be running through the five A's. And the first thing I wanted to do was to look at ask. So the five A's, look, they come in various forms, but we're using them as they're used in the SNAP guidelines. And that is smoking, nutrition, alcohol, and physical activity. And we're stretching them out beyond the smoking and alcohol and nutrition and physical activity to include other drugs as well. So really using that as a basis, the ask, the assess, the, the advise, the assist, and arrange as the five areas. Now, some of you may be sitting there going, oh, my got another mnemonic really it it's the same as what we do every day but it's just a nice little mnemonic to remind us if it helps you use it if you find it tedious you'll have your own style and way of doing it but coming to the two patients mrs g who's a 45 year old woman who you know really well she's comes she's got kids she comes along with the kids you know they've come in with the coughs and colds as they've got older and she comes in today with a cold and she noticed she appears to be overweight then we have Mr. H, who's also 45, who's a new patient who attends your practice for removal of sutures after a laceration sustained at work. Now, the first question, and I'm not quite sure how interactive we can be with you guys. Can I ask them to give us chat back or how, how does that work, guys? Yeah, yeah, you can. <coughs> yeah. So do you routinely ask your patients about lifestyle issues? Who do you ask and how often and how do you do it? Just a few little questions that you might like to respond to. If it, to post anything, you click more, then chat. Mm -hmm. 
Everyone's just listening here so they love <laughs> Oh, come on, guys, say something. <laughs> they know, oh, I, know. I, I never ask my patients about lifestyle issues. That's tedious. <laughs> <laughs> I want to remove the sutures and get on with the rest of my day because I know that's sometimes how I feel. Oh, we've Look, got someone. We've got oh, someone. Yeah, what are they saying? Especially new patients. Yep, absolutely. So especially new patients, important to ask about lifestyle issues. Um, how often, David? I'm counting on you to have a response. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Hester, while we're yep. waiting for a response, I often find that asking about alcohol and any other drug use is a, a very nice way to fit into lifestyle issues. So start yeah, with yeah. lifestyle issues. And, yep. and what about, do you smoke tobacco? Do you drink yep. alcohol? Yep. Do you I tell you what, you're, 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 um, you, this is my next screen after this one. Oh, sorry, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Yeah. Look, uh, um, sorry, can we move on to the next screen? And David's saying, yeah, he, he, he needs friends, yeah. everyone. Thank you, David. Um, look, the, the rules from RSUGP, what they're telling us we should do, lots of shoulds in there, but ask all our patients 14 years and older every three years and consider your high-risk groups. And the reality is when you start thinking about high-risk groups, there aren't very many people that aren't in a high-risk group. So pregnant people, older Australians, people with liver disease, young people, and we've got this new group of, uh, you know, us older guys in our 40s and 50s and 60s who are drinking at higher levels. You know, we're a risk group as well. This, this, the SNAP guide is available online. It's really brilliant. If you guys haven't had a look at it, it's really useful. I'm finding a lot of my GP registrars use it and they'll come out to me and they'll say, oh, I snapped that patient. Um, <laughs> so have a look at it. It's really great. Can I move you on to the next slide? So this is kind of coming, I, I, I think, Kylie, to what you were going to say. And, and the first thing about ask, asking this first um, part of the five A's is asking permission and setting the scene. So if you see someone with a drug and alcohol issue in a drug and alcohol setting, they're kind of expecting to be asked about drug and alcohol. But in a general setting, they may not be expecting it. They may not see it as part of your role or they may not feel that you want to know. Um, and so really setting the scene and normalising it. As part of my routine review of all my patients, I always ask about lifestyle factors. And as you said, Kylie, that's starts with things like exercise, diet, stress, alcohol, and other drugs. Is it okay if I ask you about these? So you're explaining why and you're asking permission. So, and the other issue that happens for us in general practice is that people sometimes present with their drug and alcohol issues, but they may present um, looking for other things. So our guys come in with his removal of sutures and our woman's come in with her cold. Uh, and as Amanda pointed out, it's really common for people to have comorbidity with mental health and drug and alcohol. So if you pick up somebody who's having some issues with a mental health issue, it's really, they are a high risk group for drug and alcohol issues as well. But by asking it in this way, Hester, you're also not assuming that the patient wants to answer the question yeah. and give them an opportunity to say, look, no, I'm not comfortable. Exactly, exactly. So moving on to the next slide. Um, so, you know, we have said to Mrs. G, you know, I want to ask you, is it okay? And she says, sure, but is this going to take much time? I've got to get away to pick up the kids from school. You know, and so it may be that that's just letting her know, look, it's really not going to take very long or we can make another time. If you're not ready to talk about this now, that's absolutely fine. The other thing is that this woman has a chesty cough. Is she a smoker? Is there, is there some kind of clinical issue that you can intervene with? Mr. H, new patient, work injury. He says, yeah, sure, but how private's my information? So there may well be people that, that raise their concerns and you do need to address those. I have to say in my practice, I've never had anybody say, no way am I going to tell you, but I have had these two responses. And you as a, as a practitioner need to decide how you respond to those. Having, having opened up the conversation and, and, and um, to kind of let them know that you're really happy to talk about this stuff is, is actually really useful. And it may be that people will go in six months time when they're thinking, actually, I do need to talk to someone about my alcohol or my ice use. I remember that doctor asking me, maybe they're going to be okay with me talking to them about it. Moving on. So once you've asked, then there's your, be, be, your brief screen. Um, we'll be talking more about screening tools. I'll leave that to, to Kylie. But once again, looking at have you ever, in the last three months, have you? And just run through them, you know, run through them from beginning, you know, from less kind of risky to more or, or, or less stigmatised. You know, use tobacco, alcohol, recreational drugs, cannabis, cocaine, methamphetamine, methamphetamines, others. And it allows them, it's just rolls off the tongue. It's something that I do with everybody and they can go, no, 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 yes, yes, yes. Have you had any problems with your mental health? Do you or others have any concerns? Do you have any problems with this, this use that you're, you're using? Are you having issues trying to cut down? Are you having cravings? Are there things that you're worried about? Do you want this to be different? 
So moving on from there, um, so then we asked Mrs G, the mum with a cold, and she said, look, I get a bit worried from time to time and recently I feel more overwhelmed. I'm not sleeping very well. I smoke cigarettes and I drink alcohol sometimes and it helps me to feel more relaxed. I've never taken any other drugs. So you've gotten a really good history just from that, from those open-ended um, questions. What else might you need to ask? We've got a little bit of group chat. David King said, should do more often, especially in a group practice. Many patients flow between doctors or avoid noisy, nosy doctors. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I yeah. think when um, providing a rationale and a strong rationale of what you're asking in connection to what the patient's presenting for can help reduce, yeah. that, reduce that nosy perspective. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, Mrs G coming in with her chesty cough, uh, you know, quite often for us in general practice, it'll be clear when somebody's a smoker. Um, you can see it or you can smell it or you can, you have a really good clinical reason to ask. Um, and what we know about the evidence with smoking is that GPs do ask about smoking and our patients do expect us to ask about smoking and do expect us to support them to change that behaviour as well. Uh, so what else do we need to ask? I think we might move on to the next slide. So ask how much how often, how taken, any problems, any issues, any harms, any features of dependency or substance use disorder. So this is another way of thinking about this. And, and many of us older doctors have learned about dependency, but now what we're looking at is substance use disorder, which includes, can include dependency. And dependency is a kind of a psychological dependency or a physical dependency, which includes um, uh, tolerance. So needing to take more to get the same effect and withdrawal symptoms when you try and stop the substance that you get specific withdrawal symptoms. And substance use disorder adds to that. And under DSM-5, there are 11 categories and I'm not going to run through them, but when I think about it, I think about tolerance and withdrawal. I think about the way that it takes control of people's lives, the way that it becomes bigger and bigger and more salient in what they do. Um, a, 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 attempts to cut down that are unsuccessful uh, and cravings and using despite harm. It's stopping, it interferes with your life, your parents, your family, everybody's worried about you and you're continuing to use when it's causing you harm. The other thing is that you've got to consider that risk in the context of the individual, as we talked before, the elderly, adolescents, pregnancy, liver disease, uh, all increase a person's risk. Okay. Um, and David's just, David, you're a, you're a lifesaver, mate. He's just put in here, what else would she, what else would, would we ask? He's put, is she worried about it? And where is she on the cycle of change? And that's certainly something that you cannot get away when you're doing a webinar with psychologists. It will be talked about. <laughs> Moving on to the next slide. Oh, just before you go to the yeah. next slide, I just do want to flag trying to avoid pejorative language like alcoholic, addict and junkie. Um, but as a psychologist, I also avoid the word problem. Mm -hmm. The problem for you. But it ties in, I think, with a comment that I think David just made about what, what are you worried about? Mm. I, I often turn that back if the patient says to me, you know, I'm not an alcoholic or something like mm. that, um, I'll turn that back and say, well, what are you worried about? Mm. Yeah. And I think it's that really important thing of acknowledging uh, that an individual is an expert in their own lives uh, and we are, we are uh, privileged to actually have have input into their lives. And they are, they are adults and they make their own choices. Uh, and it's about allowing people that self-agency to make those choices. At the same time, expressing your concern about risk and harm. So Mrs G, she says, I smoke 25 cigarettes a day and I have the first one 10 minutes after waking up. Just a little aside guys, that this is a really useful measure of the level of dependence on nicotine. The earlier after waking people have their first cigarette gives you a really good indication of their level of nicotine dependency. Now, she stopped when she was pregnant with her kids, but started again after the birth. I don't know about you guys, but this is a really common story that I see in my patients. And her now 11-year-old daughter is hassling her and telling her that she needs to give up smoking. She has three to four times a week. She drinks a bottle of sweet wine. She says it helps her to relax. She doesn't sleep so well without a drink. And her husband is worried about her drinking. So. Any thoughts about that, guys, particularly about the risks or the concerns that you have? 
I might get my fellow conspirators to give some ideas while we're waiting for David or somebody brave to respond. <laughs> That's Amanda. Yeah, I'd be thinking maybe, you know, mood could be an issue here. She's got problems sleeping. She's, we know that, you know, problem drinking, depression go hand in hand. She's, anxiety is a precursor of depression a lot. Um, but she, the good thing is she's got a husband who's worried about her. She's got social support and her daughter's a bit concerned about her. So I'd be having those sorts of thoughts going through my mind. But it could also be that the alcohol's contributing to the sleep disturbance. So mm -hmm. it may well be knocking her out, but it's then creating a disrupted, a disrupted sleep pattern through the night. Mm. Mm. The other thing for me as a GP is uh, somebody drinking uh, a 750 ml bottle of sweet wine, they're getting a lot of calories or kilojoules and this woman is overweight as yeah. well. So there's another way that you can begin to have a conversation about change. Uh, and, you know, so we've talked about the issue of, you know, really, really helping people to understand where they are in terms of wanting to change. But you can also use motivational interviewing, which we will go to in more detail, to help actually shift people in terms of starting to think. Uh, and David has said uh, a, a nice comment. She, um, she's being hassled by her family and recognises the need to change. Yeah. The other thing I think with, with this, with Mrs G, is that the, the smoking and the alcohol has, it, it does something in her life. It's important to her in some way and understanding that is really important in terms of helping people to change. What would you guys say about that? The meaning that it has. Well, for, for me, I was just waiting for anyone to respond, but for me, um, as a psychologist, I'd be very interested in um, her, her sleeping patterns and what's going on there. And I'm wondering if there's a generalised anxiety disorder that might be going on with a lot of worry that's interfering with sleep. So she's having to take, she's having to drink to help quieten and dull down those thoughts. Um, the other thing that I'd be wondering is, is she smoking more when she's drinking? And every behaviour serves a purpose. So there'd be many different functions and roles that um, that drinking and smoking would, would serve for Mrs G, especially as a, a relaxant. So I'm wondering if she's also very busy and these are quick fixes to being able to switch off at the end of the day. Yeah. The other thing, just thinking about the sleeping, doesn't sleep so well without a drink. Mm. Part of me is kind of thinking, oh, is there a little bit of dependence? Is there a little bit of withdrawal? I know, I know it's pretty low levels, uh, but that's the other thing to consider. It, it's Parker. I, again, um, certainly sounds as though um, a concern is underlying anxiety or depression. The, the other thing is probably what's been the, what's been the um, trajectory of that drinking how long has she been drinking at that level? Um, and does there seem to be any other things in her life that are associated with increasing drinking if she has been, or is this a long-term thing? Yeah. Okay. So looking at Mrs G, she's nicotine dependent, has had previous successful attempts and her family wanted to stop. So from my point of view, it's really important to, to acknowledge that people have had attempts that have been successful for a period of time. She's, her alcohol, she's drinking at risky or hazardous and perhaps dependent levels. The sweet wine is the weight, using to relax sleep. As we've mentioned, the mental health issues, her family concerned. Yep, and as David said, does she want to change? The other thing is actually just talking to her about the risks. Is she aware of the risk? Is she aware of how this can affect her weight, affect her sleep, affect her mood? And to really, really give her a chance to actually think through how it's affecting her and her family. The, the other thing that I would ask her is what led her, because she's had successful quit attempts before, what led her to returning? Mm. Mm. And if she did decide to make a change, what would be the first step for her and what would she do differently that might be more effective for her? So they're change questions that I would ask. Yeah, yeah. So she says, my friends have told me they're concerned about my drinking. I know I should drink less, but it really helps me. I think I need to stop smoking. How would you, how would you respond to that, Kylie? Um, can you, that she thinks she needs to stop smoking? Mm. I would ask her, 
what led to that decision? What's mm -hmm. happening to make her um, consider that this is like now is um, a time to change? Yep. Well, she says, I've got that chesty cough. Yeah. And I, I would completely validate that. And that's a really good reason. And, you know, your health is really important. And what other reasons would mm. you consider, um, you know, are, are important for you to quit smoking or to... Yeah. I'd, I'd point out, um, Hester, that there's really no reason we couldn't look at both the alcohol and the smoking, um, but then hand that back to her and ask her what her, her thoughts about that and what does she think she can achieve at home. Hmm. I, look, I think it's, it's an interesting thing because patients very commonly will say, oh, no, I can't deal with them all at once. Hmm. Uh, and my experience is usually it's the smoking is the last to go. Um, I can't deal with them all at once. I can only do one at a time. But some people do very successfully just stop them all. I, I don't know what your, your clinical experience is with, with multiple um, change in terms of drugs and alcohol. Have you had many people that have been able to go, look, you know, I'm stopping it all? Yeah, so Mandy, yeah, we um, do find that. Sometimes mm. we might say things like, I'm going to put my management hat on and just, you know, stop them all. And they mm. do that. And it really fits in well with a psychological theory of addiction, which mm. sees an excessive appetite. And people sort of have um, addictions in several areas and they can apply the same processes to reducing those addictions across the board. So mm. often they feel a better bang for their butt by improving on several behaviours at the same time. Mm. And often what you'll find is people will stop one drug but escalate another as a form of compensation, I guess. Yeah. Yes, that's really common. That's really uh, common. I've noticed that particularly with cannabis if because mm. they often mix tobacco, which they call spin, into it. So um, whenever I do a cannabis assessment, I'll always ask if they mix tobacco or spin um, with it because that's something that I'm mindful of. I've also had um, on some occasions a bit of a different experience where people have gone, I want to, I want to stop drinking, um, I don't want to stop my speed use, but I want to stop my drinking. Don't talk to me about my speed use. We've concentrated on their drinking. And then over time, when I've gone to check in about with how their um, speed use is, is going, it's dropped quite considerably. So I find that even though it's best to stop and try and promote quitting all, um, for some people, it, ha it has worked focusing on one drug and, and then they're just without realising it, applied those skills to the other drug. Yeah, and I think, once again, it's just, it's just working with where that person is at and what, they, what, is, what, what is important to them, what is concerning them. Yeah. So for Mrs G at the moment, it's my smoking. I have a chest infection. I need to stop smoking. Yeah. And certainly the evidence says that there's no reason that people can't address two at once test yeah. yeah, exactly. And the evidence says that the problem with not addressing certainly smoking at the same time as everything else is that we forget. Yes, yes, yes. That classic thing of, oh, my patient is doing so well. They're only having 10 cannabis, uh, 10 bongs a day and, and a pack of cigarettes, you know, and that's, that's success. The reality is that those are the things that are going to kill them. Uh, but, you know, I think uh, it, it, once again, it's, you know, talk about, don't, don't accept the idea that they can only give up one at a time. Yeah, do, do use that information that you, you, you could and people do give them all up. If that works for you, we can do that. If it doesn't, but it's yeah, an option. It's a lot of options. If you go with the smoking, I think, you know, the next time or the time after you can certainly say, as she's making progress with the smoking, say, well, how does that fit in with your drinking? Yeah. She might be finding that she's lapsed into smoking when she's drinking, so the light will come on and she'll mm. be able to say, oh, yeah, I think I want to do something about the drinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shall we move on? Yeah. Uh, so this is coming to our um, outcome measures or our measure, uh, tools, our validated tools. So I've got the audit C that I've put here and, and Kylie's going to talk about them in more detail. Um, but this is for Mr. H with the work injury. When you ask him how often and how much does he drink on a day when he's drinking and how often does he have six or more drinks, he's drinking 15 to 16 standard drinks three times a week. So one of the really interesting and important things when you're looking at uh, doing an assessment of drug and alcohol use is to quantify it. 
because certainly for, for Mr H with the, the, the 15, 16 standard drinks three times a week, there's, there's a much higher risk um, for him as well. Does anybody want to make any comments about that? Oh, we've moved on. Okay, uh, so Mr H says, I had a time when I was really low after my marriage broke up. I'm doing better now. I smoke cigarettes and have a couple of cones at night to help me relax. I drink a bit with the boys. I've used ice a few times in the past. Okay. So thinking about what are the issues, we've got a comment from Jan Dunn Trethowen. Um, just found how to communicate. People can reduce many drugs. It depends on the context. If a person is pregnant or facing the courts, I find pregnant women can make it easier to give up. With court presentations, I find illicit drugs are usually the best to work on first. And, and certainly this is the story that we've had with Mrs G was that she managed to give up her smoking when she was pregnant um, because it, it is a really common thing when you're pregnant, you don't want to affect your baby. But then when the baby comes along and it's busy and life gets tough, you, you, you turn back to some of your coking mechanisms and it is really common for people to start smoking again. It but it's looking at working off. on that. It could be the window of, of, of opportunity that Melbourne yeah. only describes. And um, yeah. I guess for us, it's the, the key is being able to identify that window of opportunity and taking advantage of it. Yeah, yeah. So looking at Mr H, what are your thoughts, guys, on, on this? Uh, you know, the, the things that's going on for him. So this is a man that came in with a work-related injury. He's come in for removal of sutures. He's, he's a new patient that you don't know, 45-year-old. Uh, and he's, he's been okay. He asked a little bit about, well, how private is my information? But he's actually talking about some really important stuff. Feeling really low when his marriage broke up. Doing better now. I smoke cigarettes, a few cones at night, drink a bit with the boys. I used ice a few times in the past. What are your thoughts? So maybe while we're waiting for our, um, our participants, what do you reckon, guys? Um, I'd ask about what's changed in that is doing better now. What does he mean by that? Um, part of your vignette is being covered by um, questions. So if I go a bit off track. Um, mm, please do. But I'd be asking a little bit more about um, his cannabis use and how that's been in the past, just to see if I can um, find out if he's smoking a little bit more in response to coping with the marriage breakdown. Um, as, as well as, um, you know, how often he drinks a bit with the boys and what does he mean by a bit? What's he drinking? Um, how much is he drinking? So I'd be sitting a little bit more at that assessment phase and, and really asking a lot of open-ended questions and reflecting back what he's telling me just to get a bit of a snapshot of what's going on for Mr H so then I can figure out you know, what the next step might be or what any red flags might pop up for me because I know, and it might be a bit of a stereotype from what I see, so it might be that clinical bias, but, you know, we see a lot of men at work who are, um, it is at the end of the, they've had a relationship breakdown and they're struggling to adjust and sometimes if they've got children, it means that they spend less time with their children. So I'd like to really know a little bit more about what's going on for him. But I'm reading this, Hester, as though he's brought a lot of this up himself. Mm. And whilst he's saying he's not particularly worried about it, he's telling you that he is. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Is he telling you he's worried or is he just responding to you saying, I want to ask you about this stuff? Well, he, he's brought much of this up himself. Yeah. So I think he's telling me that, you know, he, he's concerned about it. Mm. He doesn't know how concerned he should be. Mm. Mm. I think it also reflects in adding to that that, there's a nice rapport going on with this patient that this patient feels comfortable enough to have a chat to you about that because he's in for something else. Yeah. 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 So I think, um, I, and, you know, certainly in terms of the drinking, we, we saw before, I think maybe our slides got a bit muddled, but that he actually is drinking 15, 16 standard drinks three times a week. Um, he's using cigarettes and has a couple of cones at night. And probably, as Kylie said, he's going to be mixing um, some tobacco in with his cannabis, his cones that he's having at night. He's only having a couple at night. Um, and he's used a bit of ice in the past. So I think there's a lot of, there's, there's lots of information here, but when I see this, I'd be very gently wanting to understand more about what's actually going on now and what, what he actually means. I guess he's a little worried about it. And you, you also, as a clinician, you also need to be a little careful about the fact mm. that this was a workplace incident. So is it mm. covered by work cover? 
Yep. And is he concerned about how his behaviours may impact on the work cover claim, for example? Yes. And, and Anna Baun has said, uh, did the injury happen at work after drinking? So was he intoxicated at work? And for, for that is one of the issues for people if they have a big night, um, it's, the, it's the drive to work in the morning when they'll get the DUI or they're actually still, um, you know, either still intoxicated or just not, uh, you know, feeling so well in the morning and, um, you know, that's when the injury happened. Um, I that there's a few more things coming in with our, with our chat that I just wanted to come to. Um, the other thing is somebody saying, you know, is there high, high risk behaviours and what's happening? Are they injecting? And certainly that's something that we do need to think about with ice use. Quite often people will smoke it, but they can also inject it. And there are um, injecting, possibly injecting related harms that could happen with that. The other thing is uh, David King has said, how much do the boys drink? So he drinks a bit with the boys. He might think he's a light drinker. So maybe he's a light drinker and the others are much heavier drinkers. Um, and one of the things, I don't know if you guys find this, but sometimes people will will start to worry when they pick up that their drinking is different to their mates. Mm, yeah, definitely. Working in drug and alcohol, um, that would often, it was the social sort of aspect that sort of brings them into, mm. um, they didn't realise how much they're drinking and then they start to realise and um, yep. It, yep. it's, it's a big, big thing that brings men into treatment. Yeah. So a lot of measures he's used there are really quite subjective and we need something more objective in terms of measures to be able to assess where he's at. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to um, go back to something that David King said, you know, in a busy practice, you wouldn't be able to do this all in one go. You're absolutely right. Uh, and that's one of the advantages that we have in general practice, that we can have someone like Mr. H and say, look, if you just come in for your removal of your sutures today, but we've started to pick up this. I am concerned. It'd be really great if I could see you again. Uh, and they may choose not to come back or they may come back in six months time or they may go elsewhere. But it may be that all you've, you've done in that short appointment is to just raise your concerns um, and and see where they want to go with that, uh, and so that may be all you need, all you can do in an appointment. And we're not for a moment suggesting that you do a full, comprehensive drug and alcohol assessment and treatment plan uh, all in one go, unless you happen to have the time. Shall yeah, we move so on? That gets, that gets back to communication. You don't want to give somebody quick, brief advice that might seem judgmental if it's yep. ill-placed. Yep. But at the same time, if you can just plant a seed, sometimes yep. it can. Exactly, exactly. Yep. Moving on. Okay, so he, oh, here we go. This is, I don't know quite what's happened here. Oh, here we go. So he's smoking five cigarettes a day. He mixes cigarettes with his cannabis, a couple of cones at night, 15, 16 standard drinks on Friday, Saturday, and sometimes Sunday night, ice in the pass. And the workplace injury happened on a Monday after a big weekend. All you guys were right. Um, so, and, uh, and Jan has also said here, also check he knows employment, WH and S implications if you were tested as a result of his injury, random drug testing or, or alcohol testing at work. Okay. All right. I think we've kind of discussed that. So let's move on. So once again, it's, do, do you want to change this? And this is part when we're thinking about, so we've gone from the ask to, and we've been talking about the assess, which is what we're covering today. So asking permission, can I, you know, this is what I would like to do. I care about you um, and my patients. And I, you know, do, do you do these behaviours? Is it all right if I ask you? And then start a part of doing that assessments is, do you want to change? So Mr. H responds and says, I'm not worried about the ice. I didn't like it. I don't think I'll do that again. Cannabis, hmm, I'm not sure. I really like it and it helps me sleep. Alcohol, yeah, I've been thinking about it. My new girlfriend is getting pretty annoyed and I reckon I was still half pissed at work that morning and that's not okay. I can't do that again. And I get into fights. So what do we think it might be going on for Mr. H? I think it might ask you guys to comment. It takes a little while for the chat to come through. I'll just comment on the time while we're <laughs> thinking of an answer to that. We've got um, 10 minutes left, I think. So um, we need to, we probably need to, what happens if we go over time, guys? Is it possible or? Yeah. yeah? 
oh, we can go a little bit over time, but most people will be expecting to finish at seven. Yeah, I think we should. I think we should finish at seven. And and really, with this one, it's it's that we can continue on in the next webinar, looking at what's actually going on in terms of moving into the um, advise and assist and arrange. So let's move on. Assessment tools. Kylie. Okay. <laughs> so um, given the time frame, I'm going to shorten what I'm going to present. However, if you have any additional questions or you'd like to know more, we can cover them in future um, webinars. I, my, I have two agendas here with the cover, covering the assessment tools that we're doing. The first one is that I do acknowledge that GPs do not have time to do assessment tools during their consultation. So my proposal was um, to maybe consider doing them when you're doing your mental health care plan because you're already doing the K10. And um, the first three in particular are similar formatting and time frame to the K10. So it already fits in with maybe a lot of um, assessment behaviours that a lot of GPs are doing. So the reason why I, we're covering them is that it's really important when you do, um, when you're using an assessment tool that is accurate and valid. Um, and the assessment tools that we're covering are very appropriate and evidence-based for primary care settings, especially for NGP settings. So we'll just move on and I'm going to focus on the audit, QDIT, R and the DUDIT. And the reason why I'm going to focus on them and then we can just skip the others is that at Hunter Primary Care, if you refer a patient and you've identified alcohol, cannabis or another drug that's being used, in our initial assessment, we will administer these questionnaires to the patient, um, depending what their drug of choice is. And in our feedback letter to you on our initial assessment, we will give you the audit score, the QDIT score or the DUDIT score. So I just wanted to run through them. I know Hester's covered the audit C, which is the first three items of um, the alcohol use disorders identification test, um, which is the subscale for consumption. So I just wanted to give you a snapshot of what these assessments cover and, and how they build up and why they were chosen. So I do invite you to use them when you do your mental health care plans if it's appropriate. So the audit was developed by the World Health Organization and it's considered to be the gold standard alcohol self um, report assessment. And that's because it's been normed on a range of patient, um, different patient populations people from different cultural backgrounds, including Aboriginal populations. So as you can see, like the K10, it has 10 items and it's a Likert scale of naught to four and you sum um, the scores up to get a total score out of 40. Um, the cutoff scores are, um, is eight for risky drinking. Uh, some research says for women and younger people, the cutoff score is seven. So a score of um, 8 to 15 indicates um, medium levels of alcohol misuse. 16 to 19 is higher levels of alcohol misuse and scores of 20 or more indicate that um, a further assessment for an alcohol use disorder is, is typically warranted. So um, the other three, the other two subscales, which are, are items four to six cover symptoms of alcohol dependence and items seven to 10 cover um, alcohol related harms. So I'm just going to move along. So can I just, can um, I ju I'll just make a quick um, point about that. I love the audit score. I reckon it's brilliant. Some of my colleagues mm -hmm. in general practice may well love scores. If you don't, look at, look at what, what's in there and it's questions that we're asking anyway um, and take from it what's useful for you. Exactly, you know? exactly. Um, yeah. It, that's exactly right. And I suppose what I like about it is that it asks about drinking um, patterns over the past 12 months. Um, but it also gives you the opportunity to educate the patient on what a standard drink is mm. so that they compare how much they're drinking to a standard drink. So they might think they're drinking four, four drinks and that's okay. But if they convert that to a standard drink, it's often you know six plus standard drinks that they're drinking and they're usually more concerned about that number. So the alcohol use disorder is a re um, identification test is a real good opportunity for some psychoeducation around drinking. 
Yep. So just moving on to the cannabis um, use disorder identification test. As you can see um, in the next slide, that it is based on, um, the formatting is very similar to the audit. However, it differs in that it only asks about cannabis use patterns in the past six months. And instead of um, the 10 items in the revised edition, there is eight. So the total score is out of 32. Um, the cutoff score for the QDIT is eight, for, and that indicates that there's potential hazardous cannabis use and a score of 12 or higher suggests a, pon a possible cannabis use disorder. So I'm hoping you're writing um, these scores down so that when, um, if you get our um, initial assessment, our sixth session and our final session letters and these instrument um, scores are on there that you'll have an understanding of what that actually means. So generally the higher the score, the greater um, the misuse. So then we've got the drug use disorders identification um, test. And as you can see, when we go to that slide, that um, it, it, it's also uh, based on the audit formatting. Um, it also um, covers drug use over the past 12 months. Um, and it has 11 items instead of 10. So the total score is out of 44. Um, a cutoff, a cutoff score for risky drug use is six, and a cutoff um, or a score of 25 plus indicates severe, a severe substance use disorder. I would like to flag that the QDITR and the DUDIT are not as well validated as what the audit is, so that just means it hasn't been tested on a range of different patient populations or people from different cultural backgrounds. But we, we use it um, to keep for consistency. So the next slide just shows you the remaining items and also the instructions for scoring. So as you can see, you, you just total the scores um, just like you do with the K10. So the severity of dependence scale, and, and um, I'll just quickly go through this. It was originally developed for assessing heroin um, Psycho or psychological dependence on heroin over the past 12 months. Maybe just take a minute because we've got Steve to go on. Oh, oh well, <laughs> I'm, I'm, happy, I'm happy to finish there and I can provide other information, so sorry. That's great. That's all right. Thank you you said you were going to skip over the last yeah, two. Yeah, I was going to just keep going. <laughs> so I just went with the flow. Thank you, so Amanda. Steve, Steve's going to, I think, uh, come in next. If I uh, just skip over to... Just skip the next few slides. Yeah, the next one. Oh, screen is oh, there we are. No, that's it. So that's my first one, I think. So, look, I, I'm not going to take up too much time, I'm, and I won't run through all of these roles, but um, I've just adapted some of these from the Australian Practice Nurses Association, which just goes over the, the many roles that um, primary healthcare nurses have. And in, in, in my way of thinking, my, to my way of thinking, all of these things are consistent with drug and alcohol screening and assessment. So for me, there's no reason that primary healthcare nurses can't be involved in the assessment process of patients um, around these issues. Um, I'm mindful of the fact that in my own team at the John Hunter Hospital, uh, our team is a nursing led team. So it is our nurses who are performing the assessments of the patients that we're seeing. So it's, it's not the medical staff, it's not someone else, it's the nursing staff performing the assessments. And we're just waiting for the next slide. Here we are. And the, the Royal Australian College of GPs um, includes a statement um, around practice nurses that other areas in which practice nurses have been shown to be effective include counselling patients with health problems related to their lifestyle, including smoking and hazardous drinking. Um, so it's very consistent with the roles that practice nurses have. Now, obviously, all of this needs to take place within the um, scope of practice that the individual nurse has. Some nurses won't be experienced around these issues. Others will be more experienced. Um, the other thing, I guess, that we need to consider, and Hester may be able to comment more about it, um, is around the sort of um, payment schedule that may be available for practice nurses being involved in these sorts of issues. And uh, Hester may be able to comment on that more yeah. than I can. 
Yeah. But well, yeah. So well, tries to be Go on, Hester. Uh, look, one of the one of the struggles for us in general practice is that the rebates for practice nurse item numbers is not great, but certainly in in, in my setting, uh, what we it really helps to have the practice nurse because it means that I can actually see more people, uh, and so we pay we pay our practice nurse that way because I can see more people and she does the follow ups and um, you know she's she's uh, particularly interested in assisting women with young kids uh, and, you know, helping them to change their risky behaviours. So that's worked really well for us. And in terms of the, the various opportunities for screening, I know that we, we've touched on a couple previously. We touched on universal screening and, and certainly screening people at the, the new registration level. Um, but I think this slide sort of summarises the various opportunities that may exist for um, screening of patients. So um, in addition to the universal screening idea, uh, maybe targeting screening to people with known susceptibilities, um, targeting screening towards people who present with a problem associated with their substance use. Um, it may be that screening is attended to because the patient determines that there's a need to, uh, to discuss whatever issue they may have. Um, we've already mentioned new registrations, but there may also be a range of other clinics held by the GPs um, and the nursing staff which may provide opportunities for screening, such as healthy lifestyle clinics, um, chronic disease management clinics, and mental health clinics. We're just about ready to wind up. If Park is still online, I'm not yep. sure. Hello. Parker, would you just like to mention health pathways and then we might wrap it up for this evening? Um, yeah, I think health pathways I assume that um, many, if not most, of the people today use these. Um, they really, they really are um, uh, a huge resource, and I know, especially for our registrars, you use them just all the time. As far as the drug and alcohol ones go, there are useful resources there, um, and also health pathways, as well as having um, uh, management algorithms, etc. They're um, they're a valuable source of uh, referral pathways, local referral pathways. So I just urge people to um, to to um, to use those if you're not already doing so. Thanks, Parker. Let's see what the next slides are. We're almost uh, on time. No time for questions. Check out health pathways. Questions. That's our virtually our last slide and. Um, We've had good interaction with you guys. It's seven o'clock. If you have questions, um, please feel free to email me at the University of Newcastle and I can distribute those to our, our speakers this evening. You've been fantastic. Thanks so much for joining in tonight. Not a Thanks, problem. Parker, for being at the, um, and Hester for being at a distance there. Please join us on the 13th of March for Advise and Agree. We'll be talking about brief intervention, motivation, and negotiating goals. Thanks for all your um, participation tonight. Hopefully, it'll be even more interactive next time. And see you in March. Thank you. Good night.